Um, basically, I'll, I'll try to think of what we think about when we think about Jonathan. Um, we instantly think, obviously, um, son of Saul, so he was the son of a king. Our stereotypical view of a the son of a king um, is quite spoiled, really. You know, there's no there's no pride in that. But um, Jonathan was quite unique. Obviously, Saul got made king. He was his son, but they were quite a way through their lives when um, he got actually made king. So what I'm going to try and do is I've tried, I kept trying to condense the talk, condense it. And I'm just trying to move rapidly through a few verses so we can get this character of Jonathan um, obviously out of the pages of scripture. So as we look at 13 verse 2, um, as we come across obviously Jonathan, um, we've got, we can instantly pull out this, he was in charge of a thousand people. So there was Jonathan in Benjamin, in charge of a thousand people, and obviously Saul was doing his bit. So instantly he's got this response, um, in charge of people, he's got to earn people's respect. Um, and this is where he's kind of, you first start, he's kind of concentrating on the verse, just realise that this is a guy in charge of people. Now, you've, you've got to um, think of that kind of responsibility. I mean, sometimes... I mean, at work, I'm in charge of about five people. You know, this guy was in charge of about a thousand people. So you can see that he must have had quite a bit of respect right from when we first um, mentioned of him, really. Um, and his tribe, the, um, the Benjamin tribe, um, were renowned for basically being warriors as well. Throughout the pages of scripture, most of the time when they're mentioned, it's all this um, warrior tribe. Now. Here we have in Judges that they were deadly accurate. You know, they did not miss. And this was with these slings. Now, as you kind of search around, you'll come across a few of these kind of traditional weapons. I was quite surprised, to be honest, how many websites are dedicated to these traditional weapons. Um, and this one particular website pointed out that these stones were being flung at 80 miles an hour over 100 yards. Obviously, they'll lose a bit of momentum. Um, and these guys um, were left-handed. I mean, I've played various sports between my life. You try and kick a ball with your left hand, and it's kind of, it's like your brain's not connected to it properly. Uh, but these were quite unique, and they're always mentioned about this left-handed side of things. So, as we, we move on, we come across uh, a Benjamite man as well. Um, and this was basically, he went out to assassinate. So again, you've got this kind of warrior driver, this is more of a thinking man's warrior, if you like. He, he got in towards the king with, a, with his weapon and basically killed the king and then basically off he went. Um, so that was another occasion of the Benjamites. Um, and now we come across in Chronicles as well, um, which obviously Saul is mentioned, and they could bo use both hands as well. So it's not necessarily just a left hand, you got both hands, you know, which is quite baffling to me. Um, like I say, you get quite good with one thing, whether you're playing darts or anything like that, but you've got this, this tribe of people that were using both hands, the bows as well. So we're building up a bit of a picture that the, his, his bloodline was all about this warrior, warrior side. So he had good credentials. Um, and then we come across them again. Um, with the archers, uh, with the sons of Benjamin as well, and they just mentioned about this mighty men of valour. And so whichever way we look about them, they were historically a very strong tribal kind of group of people. So Jonathan, from what we know, no instruction of Saul, attacked the Philistine garrison and then Saul obviously heard of it and announced it throughout the, throughout the land. So he's gathering up all the troops. Um, just wanted to touch on a little bit about the Philistines. Um, as you look into these people, um, you've got this reference of sea people or people of the sea. Um, and there's even archaeological stuff as well to come across. 
um, which they found in um, remnants of Philistine or evidence of Philistine people, obviously around Jordan and stuff like that. So you had this mixture of, I think it was Greeks, uh, all manner of people, creating this people of the sea, and they decided, obviously, to settle down. And because of their travelling around so much, they would have had quite a unique um, arsenal of weapons, of knowledge, so they're quite, quite, um, quite a strong enemy, um, really. Um, this is from um, Ramesses III, which recorded the kind of sea people, if you like, and this is um, an artist's impression of what a Philistine would have looked like. Um, and obviously the biggest point about it is the sword. Now, obviously when you're talking materials, when you should go through the grades of um, ferrous and non-ferrous materials, when you start getting to stuff like um, iron and steel, you, you're talking about something that's quite hard and it's going to last you a long time. Um, so that was a bit of a representation of the actual Philistines, the two people we're actually talking about um, in this chapter. Now, the Philistines gathered themselves together, and this kind of quite baffled me as we got to this. 30,000 chariots. You know, I mean, I think if we saw about 10, we'd kind of get quite worried about it. But this was 30,000 chariots that all gathered, and the, and the actual people, um, the kind of didn't they actually quote the actual quantity there was that many. So they all gathered in this massive, humongous camp in um, Micmash that we come across. Um, obviously, you got the coastal line where the main Philistines were kind of based. Um, so they've got quite a lot of way inland, if you like, and causing numerous trouble, I guess, in around the in around the area. Um, now, obviously people realised that these people were camping down. The locals, um, obviously the Hebrews, were getting quite scared, as anybody would. They started hiding everywhere, um, all around the terrain, as this massive group of Philistines started gathering. It, well, it must have been one of the scariest things out, having this massive group of people um, camping out on the land. Now, um, one of the things that I, I thought was interesting is when this, this word trembling, um, which we just kind of read and pass through, yeah, they're trembling, yeah, they're scared. Um, but when you kind of look into it a little bit, this is shudder with terror. You know, this is kind of really gut-wrenching, shaking so much, you're scared. So you've got all these Hebrews shaking with fear as these Philistines are kind of surrounding them. So you get in quite a big context here. When it says they are hiding everywhere, just to get a, an idea, more idea of the terrain. This is typical terrain um, around the area. So you've got these deep, um, new words to me, wadis, as they're kind of being called, and all these caves and everything on either side. So it wasn't like a flat field or anything like that. This was some really kind of rough terrain. Um, and then we have Saul who obviously was um, told to wait, he, he waited, and then decided to take it up on, upon himself to start doing some sacrifices um, to God. Samuel appeared just afterwards, and uh, yeah, thou hast done foolishly. They have not come out, um, they, that's how not kept the commandments of the God, of Lord thy God. Um, so, things are getting worse and worse. Um, 30,000 of these um, chariots camped out, Samuels just basically came in and basically said that his kingdom would have lasted forever it, um, and I'll take it from this, it's his genealogy, it's his sons and he's the follow-on of his, of his bloodline, would have carried on forever, um, but now it's not. So. You got Jonathan surrounded by Philistines, scared, and now you know he's not inheriting the kingship anymore. Um, and then basically it keeps on getting worse. The Philistine spoilers came out in three companies, and they were basically totally destroying the morale of the Hebrews all the way around. So as we look at the kind of solid blue lines that we've got on there. 
they're flying out in all manner of directions, returning to the camp, probably food, crops, all manner of stuff that they need for the camp, but fearless, they have nobody, nobody to stop them at all. Um, and if you think it can't get any worse, um, the picture then steps onto there wasn't any swords in the land. Um, you basically had Saul and Jonathan with a sword and no one else. Um, obviously all the smiths that were kind of beating the metal, um, they were kind of controlled by the Philistines. Um, so they basically had a few man-made things, I, I suppose, but uh, no serious weapons at all. Now, kind of, can this situation get any worse? But there's this constant within this situation um, of Jonathan. Now, it starts off as Jonathan, son of Saul, said to a young man, um, come over, let's go over to the Philistine garrisons. Um, how, many, how many of us would have said, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm right behind you. Um, I don't think many of us would. Um, and he, this armour bearer, again, as you start digging, digging through the pages, um, I gather so much respect for this armour bearer because I think this is basically where, where we're at. You know, you've got faith in, the, in God, um, but as we know, we've got works to basically do as well. So we've got someone leading us and we've got to follow. We've got to have that faith um, but the works to basically back it up. Um, so he told not his father, so this connection has basically just dropped now. Um, Jonathan has stepped up, he's, um, in my opinion he's leaving his, um, his father behind now and deciding, I know what's got to be done. And Saul was in the utmost part of Kabir, underneath a pomegranate tree. Um, not the best place, he's the leader, this is a warrior leader that should have been there leading. But no, he's over underneath the tree, and he's with 600 men. Um, now, one or two of the things I looked in, that um, Saul, kind of sort of agree with it a little bit, Saul saw himself as a bit of a Gideon um, in, the, in the Bible, and you know, he had these 600 men, but he was far from anywhere near it, really, um, because he was at the back, he wasn't leading, at all. He tried to make a sacrifice, which really wasn't his, his place to do as well. Um, so things are going drastically downhill. Uh, so then we cut back to Jonathan. So he sort of go over to the garrison and here we have kind of a verse all about some rocks. Um, so we're thinking there must be some significance about these rocks as he's going up to. Obviously we've seen the kind of the valley where he's kind of heading towards, but there's two sides, the sharp rock. Now, when you look into the um, sharp side of things, um, it's more of a kind of a tooth sticking out rather than kind of point sticking up, um, which comes apparent when you start looking at the terrain around this area. But these two rocks that we come across, um, this is a suggestion um, that we've got here of these two rocks. Now, Bozes itself, um, the word kind of you can link back to um, shining and even fine linen. Now, fine linen was used with the priests. The priests was the representation of God on the earth, um, which I thought, again, was quite, quite interesting, a little uh, kind of connection on there. And then, you've got these references which link to the same kind of words as well, which always link back to fine linen, priest, kind of the presence of, um, of God. So you've got this shining, and the actual terrain itself, the actual um, uh, substance of the rocks is actually quite a white kind of contrast as well, particularly contrasted with the, the other Guy kind of Rock was mentioned. Um, so here's kind of one of the references of the fine linen, which obviously you take back to the same word on there. Um, 
which obviously linked to the, the E5, which they used to, used to wear. Um, and I've just got um, something. Um, I've just got a quick reference here, which I, I've basically taken. Um, Bozes to shine, and the north name, the name of the north of the two cliffs stands one on each other side of a gorge in Mi'kmash, um, and it catches the sun um, during the day, while the south southern cliff is in the shade, um, which partly owes its name to kind of shining. Um, and the other side is kind of like a dark coal side of um, look about it. Um, so as we get to the um, the other side, this word you can actually reference back to bush, which is like the burning bush. So I'll try and keep the, the pace up a little bit here, but you've got the thorny kind of bush which represents obviously Israel, you've got the shining light, and obviously in the burning bush you've got the presence of God, which is obviously in the flames that are on there, um, and then Jonathan's heading towards him while everyone else is kind of hanging back. He's got his mind focused, and obviously with Hebrew names as well, he must have been quite confident in his, in his head that um, this is God's land, and I'm basically going over there. Um, here's another reference um, obviously from the link into the um, Sehenna, Sehen, the, um, the bush and the precious things of the earth and the fulfillment thereof, the good will of him that dwelt in the bush, let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the head of him that is separated from his brethren. Um, so that was just a, a quick look at those two verses on there as we carry on um, you've basically got his armor bearer said do all that is in thine heart and I am with thee according to thy heart so this is where I'm kind of coming from from the armor bearer point of view once we've got that faith, um, there's a room for a lot of kind of armour bearers amongst us um, that we can stand behind people and give them confidence. Um, and this sign, and I think it linked in quite well, this sign that he looked for, and it's confused me quite a few times when I've looked through. Um, if we stand still, then they'll come down to us. But if they say come up to us, this is a sign to us. Um, and it's baffling me for quite some time what is this sign and it's the rock itself come up so he was in the bottom of the valley and he came up um, to the rock and God um, wants us to kind of step up towards him there's no point kind of just standing still uh, as we move on, Jonathan obviously had gone into the garrison. It uh, killed the um, the actual garrison that was there, so about twenty odd people. And he climbed up on his hands and feet, which I thought was quite quite impressive. Because the Philistines could have killed him at any time, I think. Obviously lobbing stuff down at him <coughs> as he was climbing up. But no, climb up to us and we'll show you a thing or two. So there's Jonathan. I mean, massive over-exaggeration on this kind of poster. Um, but obviously the words are quite powerful. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing can hinder the Lord from saving us from many or few. Again, this is a bit more realistic of the actual terrain up there, which he would have been kind of climbing up to the uh, garrison that was there. So it was no, no mean feat, really. Um, so he climbed upon his hands and feet. He, he slew them all. I like to think he was 
had his bow on, he's got obviously the one knife, um, the one sword with him and his armour bear follows up behind him and makes sure, make sure they're all dead. So he's up there doing his warrior thing. Now, he must have had great confidence in his own skills, but also that he was doing the right thing. And that if you do the right thing, um, God will be there. If you're doing God's work, God will be there, but you've got to take that action to do it. Um, which was quite, which came out quite. And here's this word trembling again as we go through. Um, so the Hebrews had trembled, now it's the Philistines' turn to tremble. Um, now, all it was was this act of Jonathan, sheer kind of fearlessness, climbing up with his armour bearer, and everyone else was trembling in fear. And he got up there, and it was almost like a roar from God. He got up there, killed these, tw these 20 people that was up there, and now it was their turn. I mean, he mentions about um, which a, a yoke of oxen might plough. Uh, one of the things I read is, it basically mentions that two oxen by the side of each other, there would have been quite a narrow path, so it was literally fought his way through. This, um, this pass. So, he killed the 20 people, um, and then they began to tremble, and there was a great trembling across the area. Um, and obviously Saul, and his um, watchman, realised something was kicking off, and um, yeah, he thought, right, we better, we better do something about this. Um, so we move on again, Saul thought, right, we're going to find out who's missing. And to his surprise, and the armour bearers and Jonathan were missing. So the next bit that kind of stumbled me, if you like, was this bit. And Saul said to Ahia, bring hither the ark of God. For the ark of God at this time was in the children of Israel. Um, we know from later passages that David went to get the Ark of God. Um, and it specifically says that it was there, uh, I think it mentions 20 years. So, I'm thinking, they're in this rough terrain, did they, they go back and bring this kind of, the Ark of God on there? But when I started looking into it, you've got this Greek kind of translation, which puts it slightly differently. Um, bring the ephod, for he wore the ephod in that day before Israel. Um, and as these things kind of trouble us, we start digging a bit deeper again. And we look at the interlinears on there, and we've got, and Saul said, as we kind of move, move across, so we go, and Saul, and said, Saul, to a hijer, um, bring here the ark of God. Now obviously the ark, basically the word means box. So we've got box, we've got of God here, and then we've got this bring bit. So I kind of looked into these and I thought, well, where, where's this information coming from about this being ephod? And when you start looking at this bring, it's always used of the ephod. It's bring the ephod. And it's used of other things as well, but it's never kind of used of the, of the ark. And I thought, ah, this is a bit interesting. Um, so I basically started going through the references that we've got on there. And the Samuel one is the only one that says Ark on there. Now this, there's a lot of information that kind of points to this being the ephod. Um, withdraw thy hand. Um, as far as I know, this kind of thing, when they're kind of praying... Or, or doing it, it's not done with the ark. So, with doing your hand, you've got the ephod. Obviously, from a pocket point of view, with the, um, the priest's hands, withdraw thy hand. A um, little bit of sideline, but thought it was interesting, even as a kind of discussion on point on there. Um, so, as we, as we continue, they assemble ourselves in battle. And every man saw it's great confusion that God brought on them. 
Jonathan made the step. God was right behind him. He did the action. God backed him up. Basically, there's great, great discomfort. The Hebrews and the Philistines um, started going on the run. And and they basically went up to the into the camp. And obviously you've got Ephraim up there as well when they heard they basically come down. So as we get back to our map again, you've got it all starts kicking off, they start running away. The men of Ephraim start coming down as well, and they all hear they all hear that they're on the run. Now whether it was a great thundering or whether it was Jonathan, which I imagine if they're all hiding in things and they kind of, there's Jonathan walking across, they'll say, oh look, there's Jonathan, where's he going? But they're kind of too scared to kind of join him and he kind of carries off. He's at this garrison, which I like to think, he, he climbs up, he's on this plateau, um, and Jonathan rallies the troops, come on, everybody, come out of your holes, we're going to go and chase these Philistines, they're in our land, let's get them out. Um, so off they go. And they start chasing them. Um, and obviously, for some reason, Saul said, Cursed is the man that eats. Um, until, this is the most important bit, I think, I have vengeance on my enemies. Um, when we look at David, when we look at Jonathan, it's all the God's will, God's people. Um, that there's this Samuel now taking on this role of this um, earthly king, my enemies. So he cursed them not to eat. Now they chased the Philistines to, I would say this right, Ahia John. And if you look at this, this is where they're kind of, they're over here. This is where they chased them to. Keep in mind, Jonathan's done two garrisons, he's continued to fight, proper warrior. That which I can show at the end, I've downloaded this thing that's got the map of Israel, which you can kind of zoom in on and you can pinpoint things. 15 miles! Now, I've had the, when I was younger, I did the odd marathon. Um, but 15 miles, not eating, chasing Philistines, fighting with them. Um, why? And then, when this is all kicked off, um, obviously Saul wants to know what's going on, they cast lots, and then we come to this verse. Now we need to, I think, really understand kind of what this guy's gone through. He knows his father's king, he, he's done God's will, he's kicked one garrison, he's gone to the next garrison, he's quite clear in his head that these Philistines shouldn't be in the land, he mentions them as being uncircumcised, so he's got absolutely nothing to do with the Hebrews at all. And then, I've actually got an audio Bible which reads this slightly different, which I was a bit disappointed in until I looked into it. Um, and when you look, I but tasted a little honey with the end of the rod that was in my hand, obviously rod being quite important, kind of authority side of things. And my audio Bible says, and lo, I must die. This isn't that at all. This isn't how it reads. And lo is a surprise. It's a expressing surprise. So it's like, I suppose you get this with kind of some teenagers. I've done this, I've done that, I've done this, I've done this. And lo, I must die after all that. Um, it was pure kind of shock. It was emphasis kind of behind it. Um, and obviously his fellow brethren, which he had had a previous conversation with, saying when they were in the battle when he first took the honey, my father has troubled the land, which again when you look at that um, word in concept, land can mean firm, so Hebrew, they were attacking them and they would have been firm attacking these Philistines, but they've been troubled. Then you got this. You, it's really quite, I mean, uh, 
when you get into it, it's, it is, really is quite surprising. Um, so basically just trying to draw the last bit of character out of Jonathan, this warrior, as I'm getting through it. I've got Psalms 7, verse 10. My defence is of God, which saveth the upright in heart. This is linked to um, Sahenna, the bush, the thorny bush, the upright thorny bush, which that area was known about, of this thorny bush, so it's kind of Israel, it's the person being upright. God judges the righteous, God is angry with the wicked every day. If he turns not, he will wet or hammer out his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. He hath also prepared for instruments of death, for he has ordained his arrows against the persecutors. God's not going to do it all. We've got to step up to the plate. And when we do, the faith bit gives us that strength, and that's when God will be behind us. And all this kind of, to me, started summarising Jonathan. And one of the ones I think I've got here, I'll, uh, Joshua 23, verse 6, Be ye very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the Lord Moses, that ye turn not aside thereof, to the right or to the left, that ye not come across the nations, these will have to remain among you, neither make mention of their name, their gods, nor cause to swear by their, or serve them, nor by bow yourselves unto them, but cleave to the Lord your God, and he hath done unto this day, for the Lord has driven out before them the great nations, and be strong, but as you, but as for you, no man hath able to stand before you, this, you unto this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand, for the Lord God, for the Lord is your God. One man will chase a thousand. Um, Jonathan knew he couldn't do it by himself. Um, the scripture points to this in quite a few occasions of one man chasing a thousand. Um, obviously in Samuel 2, 1, um, verse 22, <coughs> For the blood of the slain, for the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan, turn not back. He didn't look back. He was straight there, focused on what he had to do. Um, and he got respect of people. He didn't demand it which Saul ended up doing by threatening people and obviously later on killing priests and trying to get loyalty off people. There is one occasion as well where he said that the son of Jesse, can he give you this? Can he give you this? Can he give you that? He didn't understand, does he? It wasn't him, his to give. And Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives. The death, even in death they weren't divided. They were swifter than eagles and stronger than lions. I mean, you can't get a better description, if you wanted one, of warriors. Um, Psalms again. For who is God? Save the Lord. Or who is a rock? Save our God. It is God that guideth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He that maketh my feet like hinds or deer that feet that settleth upon high places. I'd use gazelle now in obviously modern terms. These rocks, firm feet, off he went. Obviously with the power of God. Looks like that deer's slipped from the other page for some <laughs> bizarre reason. Um, again, Second Samuel, for who is God? That's actually a repeat of that, isn't it? Um, what is the steps God in me that not slip? And it was destroyed. Sorry that. But yeah, as a kind of kind of draw Jonathan as a character 
um, down to one point. Um, I'll come across this. How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock have sold them up and the Lord has shut them up? Now I thought, no, sorry, goose pimply there. Um, it, I think it's quite powerful how Jonathan knew this. I got to the end and I thought, Jonathan knew this. He saw these two Hebrew named mounts. He saw this shining um, Bozes. Um, I think he understood. And the sign was come up from the first signs. The Lord had shut them up. Their rock had been sold them. Obviously, Jonathan, Yahweh, has given. 